Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the International Biochar Initiative webinar, Forestry and Biochar. My name is Caroline Pete, and I will be facilitating this webinar. Before we get started, just a bit of housekeeping. You should already be able to hear me and see the share screen. If you're hearing echoes or your sound quality is bad, just use the audio functions in the GoToWebinar toolbar, which is probably on the right side of your screen. If you still have any trouble, send the organizers a message using the chat feature. And don't worry, we are also recording this webinar. The recording and slides will be available soon after the live event. If you have a question, you can ask questions at any time using the questions pod on the GoToWebinar panel. We will handle all the questions um, at the end of the presentation with our panelists. Well, thank you for joining us. And I'm going to hand it off to our moderator, Kathleen Draper, to, to lead you through the great presentation we have for today. Kathleen, you want to take it away? Yep. Thanks very much, Caroline. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us for the first IBI webinar of 2020. I do hope you're all keeping well during these trying times. Luckily for us, webinars are well within compliance with all the new social distancing mandates. And I think it's important to stay positive and productive and think this webinar just might be able to help us do that in some small way. Before I dive into the webinar topic, I always like to say a few words about the International Biochar Initiative for those of you that may not be too familiar with us. IBI is a membership-driven nonprofit focused on helping to build a robust, sustainable biochar industry. One of our primary goals is to connect stakeholders, which includes researchers, biochar entrepreneurs, biomass generators, policymakers, potential customers, and increasingly, I'm happy to say, the investment community. We, we are focused on promoting good industry practices and environmental and ethical standards that support biochar systems, which are safe and economically viable. One of the ways we do that is by sharing information about successful and promising biochar end uses. And we do that through webinars, white papers, monthly biochar bibliographies, and newsletters. This is our way of trying to keep members up to date on the latest happenings in the biochar industry. Up until this year, we also hosted biochar study tours, uh, but given the current pandemic, we're gonna have to put that on pause this year. As with many nonprofits, our ambitions often outpace our funding, but we have a growing number of smart, energetic, and ambitious volunteers that have been helping us to move things forward, for which we are really thankful. If you'd like to volunteer some of your time and talents, please just re reach out to us. Our sustaining business and organizational memberships provide needed funding for which we are also very grateful. So I just wanted to give a quick shout out to some of our recent sustaining members, which include Aries Green Energy, Integrity Industrial, the Kuwait Institute for Scientific Research, and 2.Wind. I'd also like to thank the Norwegian Biochar Association for suggesting to IBI a whole new category of membership, which is now available for national level biochar associations. Norway is our first foray into this type of collaboration and we hope there will be more. Next slide. So on to the topic of today's webinar, which is biochar and forestry. As we've all witnessed over the past several years, forests are going up in flames around the globe. Efforts to reduce the fire load and mitigate the risk of catastrophic fires are now a growing priority. As all of you are no doubt aware, woody debris is an ideal feedstock for biochar, though the logistics of converting forestry debris into biochar can prove challenging. Today, we'll hear about real world techniques used in biochar and forestry projects done in collaboration with state and federal agencies, watershed councils, environmental groups, and private companies. You will learn how to convert woody biomass into biochar, plus understand more about the economics and climate impacts. Our presenter today is a friend and colleague whom I've had the pleasure of knowing for many years. Kelpie Wilson joins us today from the hinterlands of Oregon, where she's been putting her mechanical engineering background to work, experimenting with a variety of ways to carbonize forestry and tree residues and put the biochar generated to use in many different ways. She's been in the biochar world for more than a decade, including four years working with the International Biochar Initiative, 10 years serving on the US Biochar Initiative Board, and the last eight years, she's been working on a wide variety of biochar projects, which include technology assessments, market assessments, 
Alliance, Biochar Kiln Development Project Management, and she's hosted probably more biochar workshops and training than anyone outside now. So with that, Kelpie, I'll hand it to you. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, yeah, it's been a long, wild ride with biochar, um, and I've uh, enjoyed every minute of it and enjoyed working with all the colleagues like yourself, Kathleen, that I've met throughout the years. Um, so yes, I do live in the forest, so I have had hands-on experience with making biochar from forest residues. So let's get into my presentation. I've got a lot of pictures to show you about biochar and forestry. So next slide, please. So I come at this definitely through the lens of um, climate. How do we cool the earth? Um, it's it's pretty simple, really. We have to stop emitting greenhouse gases, but we also have an opportunity to draw down greenhouse gases, and we really have to do everything. Um, and so our natural systems are going to be, are very important and will continue to be very, very important in cooling the earth. Next. Um, so there have been a few studies like this one, the graph that I'm showing here, uh, trying to quantify natural climate solutions and what we could expect to see um, in terms of drawing down carbon. And, you know, the first thing you see really is that forests jump out as being the big one. Uh, reforestation, better forest management, saving the forests that we have from being converted. These have a very large capacity for drawing down carbon. And in some of these assessments are, are now looking at biochar as a, a separate piece. But uh, what I'd like to contend is that, yes, biochar is very significant here, but it can also contribute to all of the other um, things you see here and that biochar can be used as sort of a, a multiplier effect on all these other natural uh, biosphere systems um, that can draw down carbon. Next slide. I think most of you have probably seen this chart here that comes from the Wolf Aminette um, report from 2010 that looked at the global technical potential. It was a broad brush look at what uh, biochar could actually do in terms of um, carbon drawdown. And so you've got on the left the CO2 removed by photosynthesis to create biomass, then the pyrolysis process giving you these three outputs of energy that could substitute for fossil fuels and result in less CO2 emissions, some avoided decay, biomass decay, and then the biochar which goes as stored uh, carbon into the soil. Um, but what we haven't really seen a lot of good quantification of really is the little blue arrow at the bottom, that loop of enhanced primary productivity. And what's important about that, next slide, is that it um, creates a virtuous cycle because it can potentially cause the CO2 removal by photosynthesis arrow to keep growing. So we could create this pump that would continually pump carbon out of the atmosphere and store it in the ground that keeps growing as you increase the net primary productivity. So that's the full potential of biochar. Um, next slide. So I live in the Pacific Northwest and I wanna just caution everybody that most of what I'm talking about here is gonna to refer to forests in the Western United States. There are many, many different kinds of forest ecosystems in the world. Wet tropical forests are going to be quite different from the temperate rainforest and the and, and, and um, temperate dry forest, boreal forest. There are many different kinds of forests. Not all of them are fire adapted. I'm going to be talking about fire adapted forests. And that includes the most incredible forest on the planet in terms of carbon, which are the coastal Oregon forests. They, um, you know, store more carbon than any other forest on the planet. And the, the tragic thing is that logging of this old growth forest really wipes that out and reduces the, the, the carbon storage potential of these forests for 250 years or more. Next. 
Um, and so what we've seen, you know, since um, Europeans came to this um, North American continent in the Pacific Northwest is that 72% of the oil growth forest has been logged. So that's, that's tragic. It also represents an opportunity if we can restore that, por that forest. That is a huge, huge carbon sink. Next. So how do we do this? How do we restore the greatest forest on earth? Um, I did spend a, um, more than a decade work on, working on forest protection um, uh, initiatives here in Oregon. Um, I guess when I, when I graduated college in the 80s with my degree in mechanical engineering, I really wanted to work on, in renewable energy, but there were no opportunities at that time. And, uh, but I had learned to love the forests of the West. And so I ended up working as a forest protection advocate. And this, we came up with lots of different um, ideas for how to restore these forests, maintaining ecosystem connectivity and mapping connections between forest ecosystems was a big part of what we did. Um, but we also, of course, wanted to protect the, the, the unlogged forests, but realized eventually we're going to have to get around to restoring the degraded areas. So that's where I see the potential for biochar is um, looking at these high fire risk plantations and other areas that have been deforested and how can we get trees back on the land. Next. So uh, I had the opportunity in 2010 to uh, vis actually visit Terra Preta sites in, uh, outside of Manaus and saw this 60 foot tall orange tree. So uh, that's pretty good evidence that in general, trees like biochar. Next. Um, and as I continued my research into biochar and trees, I found examples like this one from um, the company Carbon Gold, which has done a tremendous amount of work with trees. Definitely check out their, their work. This is an early project they did in Belize, um, growing cacao trees with biochar. And you can see the one on the left is, is much uh, healthier, bigger tree planted at the same time. Next. Um, other people have done all kinds of work with trees. Uh, here's one biochar Bob uh, visited um, banana plantation in Haiti and found similar results with biochar. Next. And it's not just, you know, poor tropical soils that um, support tree growth better when biochar is added. It's also temperate soils. So the Morton Arboretum um, here, here in the U.S. has done a lot of work with trees, um, specifically street trees um, who are, that have to survive in really uh, harsh environments. And they found all of these findings related to tree growth that um, biochar in the root zone increases survival and growth of seedlings, um, decreases leaching of nutrients, increases mycorrhizal colonization of roots and other beneficial uh, microbial um, populations, and in particular that it could reduce the impact of Phytophthora, which is uh, a water mold that is having really bad impacts in my re region, causing tree diseases like sudden oak death and Port Orford cedar root rot. Next. Um, another thing that tells me that that trees like biochar is my own experience. So I had this tote of biochar from Oregon Biochar Solutions sitting in my yard for a, a, about six months. And I went to dig the biochar out of it one day and I saw all these roots growing up through the bottom of the bag. Next. And I started pulling the roots out or, you know, I saw that the roots, tiny root hairs had gone right into these particles of biochar. So. Every root I pulled out was just completely coated with particles of biochar. So I wondered, well, where are these roots coming from? It's not, doesn't these don't look like roots from grass. Where are they coming from? Next. And uh, I saw that um, they must have been coming from those pine trees, which are about 15 feet away. And they're growing up right into this bag of biochar. And it's like, they, there's something in there they wanted. Maybe there was moisture, who knows, but the, I'll tell you a little story about these trees. You can see the foundation there is from an old house that burned down about 40 years ago. 
And so I dug in there one day and found that there was a lot of charcoal in there. So these trees already have a lot of biochar in their root zone, but they want more. They are greedy for biochar. All right, um, next slide. So as I mentioned, I work in the temperate forests of the West. That's where I've done most of my biochar work. And this map shows uh, different um, type, forest types in that in the north in the west and they range from wet coastal forests to drier inland forests um, mostly in mountainous regions next and so there has been quite a bit of research done in the western forests on biochar by u.s forest service uh, scientists and others and there's maybe not a lot of con conclusions yet about biochar and and forests but um some things are are pretty well established that biochar increases soil water holding capacity it um, can also uh, function to limit the spread of invasive species and it's very valuable as an ingredient in seedling growing media next so here's a couple of examples of of projects ongoing here in the Stanislaus National Forest in California. U.S. Forest Service researchers have um, applied some biochar around surviving trees from drought and um, hoping to monitor those to see how it impacts soil water holding capacity. Next, uh, there's a project that I was involved in in, um, in Oregon here. This is an oak meadow restoration project. So we have a lot of oak savannas in various places in the valleys and the lower elevations where, um, you know, because of fire exclusion, these old oaks are now being encroached on by young pines and firs. And so the desire is to, to remove those young pines and firs and um and re, you know to save the oaks but here what we're doing is we're charring that material and we're going to spread it around the oak trees the older oak trees and not only will that help the oaks survive but it will also discourage the spread of invasive weeds that are crowding out the native um, herbs herbaceous plants because there's an excess of volatile nitrogen in the in the environment, and weeds survive on that. And so the biochar actually can absorb some of that nitrogen and help promote the native uh, fire adapted species. Next, and then we also have a, a number of examples of use of biochar in potting media. Um, the Cal Forest Nurseries in California has been using it. Um, the photo on the right is again Oregon Biochar Solutions. You can see the difference in the root growth um, in the on the right in the pot that had biochar in it. So uh, this is a this is a growing use of biochar. Next, another reason why we think that biochar uh, making biochar and using it in the forest is a good idea is because uh, there's Biochar is naturally present in forest soils, in fire adapted forest soils. There's an estimate that up to 50% of the carbon in some of these forest soils is biochar from past fires. Next. Um, and researchers have looked at the soil profile and they have seen that since we have been actively excluding fire through fire suppression over the last um, you know, 100 years or so in the West, that the more recent soil horizons are missing a charcoal component that is present in the older soil horizons. So we don't know what, what effect that is having on uh, forest ecosystems and forest soils. Um, you know, it's a good guess, I think, to uh, say that we should probably try to return some of that char back to forest soils because they had it historically. Next. So what kind of forest management um, impacts char and soil? I mentioned, of course, fire suppression, but what other kinds of forest management 
could we look at to maybe increase the amount of char in forest soils? So management that reduces char in forest soils is fire suppression. And also increasingly we're doing a lot of thinning because without fire to thin the forests, um, we have to do it mechanically. So we're doing a lot of forest thinning and ideally we would follow that up with prescribed fire. Uh, we can't really add pre do prescribed fire on a lot of these landscapes right now because they're too thickly populated with young trees. Uh, so the fires that would we couldn't we wouldn't be able to control the fires. Uh, so management that increases char in forest soils, for instance, uh, this research research uh, group with Brimmer found that sites that experience multiple fires contain three times more char. Than where fire was excluded. So what we need to do is to do the thinning so we can bring back um, more natural fire regime to these forests. Next. There are a lot of challenges here because these landscapes have been heavily impacted. And so here's what I was talking about why you can't just bring fire back really easily um, in, in some of these um, what we call plantations, forest plantations. The, the, the issue here is fuel structure versus fuel volume. And these slides come from my colleague, Ken Carloni, who's a forest ecologist who's looked at a lot of this. So on the left, you see an old growth forest, a mature forest, and on the right, a plantation. And you see a lot more fuel volume in the old growth forest, but it's actually, so you would think that would make a, a hotter fire, but it's actually more resistant to fire than the, the younger forest next. So here, picture, this picture shows a fire that was burning in 2018. This is a picture from my deck, <laughs> my cabin. And um, this is burning in an old growth forest and it's burning kind of slow and low to the ground. Next, we watched this fire kind of creeping around for months. And this is what it looks like on the ground when it's not flaring up when conditions are right. You get this low creeping fire that takes out the underbrush and some of the small trees. Next. And this, however, is a picture of a plantation that burned catastrophically. Um, it was called the Douglas Complex fire. Every tree is dead. Next. And this map that Ken Carloni prepared shows um, the difference between the young plantations versus the old growth. So you can see the, where the circles are on the bottom. Those were the areas where you had these plantations and they were all the, also the areas of highest fire severity. Next, another example of a severe fire is the campfire, 2018 campfire in Paradise, California. It started up at the top, the head of the watershed in a town called Concow. And we had, everything came together in a perfect storm here. You had forest structure that was, um, you know, a logged forest, um, young plantations. You had topography, which also makes a difference. And also weather and climate. When you have high winds, all bets are off. Next. So in January, um, uh, Stephen Fair, who's a professor at Butte Community College has done a, a lot of work on biochar with his students. He has an amazing program down there. Um, and he uh, brought me down there for a week and worked with his students and a lot of community members. We did five days in a row of biochar production at, at different sites. Here we are in Concow at a landowner's property, one of the few who wasn't completely burned out. I mean, the town of Paradise lost 96% of its um, homes. So it was very devastating for these communities, but a few houses were, were there. People are rebuilding. There's a lot of cleanup work, a lot of dead trees. So we are there to help people learn how to do this themselves because um, it's just a massive amount of material to deal with. Next. All right, so what are we looking at in the future though with climate change? We've seen already our forests have been severely degraded. And unfortunately the projections are that it's going to get even harder to restore these forests to um, you know, their original condition. We've got, we're looking at less snow, less, perhaps less rain, 
um, different climate patterns, warmer overall, this is the future. Next. And so in our region, particularly, we're looking at a shift from evergreens to hardwoods, a more mixed um, forest with more hardwoods. And so we need to anticipate that. I've been involved with uh, Dr. Bachelet here and others at the Oregon um, State University Forestry Extension. We've been doing these programs for landowners, um, uh, you know, giving this information so they can plan for the future in how they manage their forests today. Next. So how can we create forest resilience? We've got to, we, we absolutely cannot allow these forests to become a carbon source. They are still right now a carbon sink. There's a lot of fear that, that we may reach a tipping point where forests become a carbon sink, whether through wildfire or tree death. Um, so we, we have to keep these forests healthy. This again, as I mentioned, this Natchez fire 2018, the view from my deck, watch this fire creeping around um, all summer long with a really good suppression effort. Thank you, firefighters. Next, one of the things that made me feel a little bit better about this was that 10 years previously, um, they had done a lot of thinning in the plantations that were right next to my house. And this is a picture from the day, a couple days where they were burning those piles. Next. So, you know, we say in Oregon, you're either gonna have smoke in the summer or you're gonna have it in the, in the winter, which would you, you'd rather have it in the winter. <laughs> but this is the pro process. What they do is they, they'll send people in with chainsaws and thin out the smaller trees and make these little piles, sometimes hundreds of these per acre, next. And then what they do is burn them. So those are called jackpot piles and they're constructed so that they will burn hot and complete. They're, they're tightly constructed. They don't want them to fall apart. You want it to burn all the way down to ash and take care of this fuels problem. But they do make smoke the way they burn them. And the maybe worse is the, what they do to forest soils. Next. So this is what it looks like um, when the, one of those is complete you have completely destroyed the forest soil. You're down to bare mineral rocks here, with a little bit of char around the edges. Next. And not every site is this bad, but here's a site in Colorado that is 40 years old, um, where you still see those burn pile scars. So these burn piles are not really doing any favors for forest soils. Next. So having a lot of these burn piles around, we had an opportunity, have had lots of opportunities to try doing it a different way. Uh, so first of all, smoke, conventionally what's done is that the piles are lit in the middle. And this makes a lot of smoke because anytime you have flame underneath cold biomass, you heat the biomass up, the gas comes out, and if there's no flame on top to burn it, you get smoke, next. So we just simply changed our procedure. We lit the piles on top. And then when we got down to the, the glowing coal stage, we used a little bit of water to put those out. And here I am looking at one of these burn pile footprints uh, about a year later, next. And what I saw was all these things growing there. So we didn't, destroy the forest soil, we enhanced it through this practice and we made char and sequestered carbon. Next. So now I'm gonna to talk to you about how we do this, the techniques that we've developed over the last five or six years to, um, to do this. And, and you know, the term that I like to use, overarching term is flame carbonization, making biochar in an open flame. This actually in many ways very similar to gasification and uh, combustion processes in a, in a wood stove or a furnace. Next. So what we're doing with flame, flame carbonization and what you need to realize is that biomass burns in three stages. So the first stage is a drying stage. There's always water in biomass. So you have to, you have to heat up the biomass enough so that water vapor um, leaves. And then the next phase is the volatiles in the wood will burn. So when you heat wood, 
all the oxygen and hydrogen containing compounds, or most of them, will leave as volatiles. And that is the wood gas. That is what actually sustains a flame. The, um, and, and then once those are gone, you're left with charcoal. Charcoal burns in a completely different way. It's a solid fuel, so it could only burn when an oxygen molecule actually touches the carbon, then it can combust, unlike a flame where the gas mixes with air as it, as it emits. And so basically what we're doing with flame carbonization in the forest is we're taking a log or a stick, we're burning away the outside portion of it to provide the heat to char the inner portion. And what that means, and this is very important for the efficiency of your process is small pieces char more efficiently than big logs. Next. So there are two tools that we use for flame carbonization. The first tool is the RIC, and the second tool is the flame cap kiln. So, you know, the picture on top there is the Jack Daniels RIC yard where they're making basically activated carbon for filtration just through this open RIC. And the bottom picture is where we all got the idea for a flame cap kiln, which is this Japanese kiln from the Moki company. Next. So um, the, there are two different types of processes, actually. The RIC, and they're defined by the, the flows of air and gas. So in the RIC, you've got the fuel, the wood gas moving upwards, and also the air. So it's a concurrent axial flow along the same direction. In the flame cap kiln, however, it's different because the fuel still is moving upward, but the air is all being pulled down from the top. Next. Show you a couple of pictures here that that illustrate this. So on, on the left, there's a rick, just an open rick. Air can come in from the bottom, from the sides, from everywhere. You get a high velocity of of air and fuel going together. Combustion is and mixing are happening, but because of the high velocity, the tip of the flame cools, and a lot of times unburned gas condenses out as soot or black carbon. You don't want that. This is why Jack Daniels puts a hood over their ricks now. Next. With the flame cap kiln, what we have is countercurrent flow. So, um, you know, the pan is excluding air from the bottom of the, and the sides. You build a fire in the pan and all the air comes from the top. So this means the flame length stays lower. And it also means that the char is protected from the air and does not burn. Next. And so this is countercurrent flow. And I have uh, lots of pictures of these curly flames where the, the air is being drawn down from the top. Next. Here's another one in a, a bigger tank kiln with uh, this giant flame curling down because the burning biomass is sucking the air in from the top. And what this means in a practical um, implication of this is that we don't get embers. You know, it's not like a burn barrel where you've got, or a tea lead where you've got air coming from the bottom. All the air is coming from the top. So that makes it safer. Next. Um, so I'm just going to go through the steps of how we do this in a flame cap kiln. We usually start with a rick just because it, it builds up the heat quickly. And we want to get a, a good bed of hot glowing coals on the bottom. After a minute, though, it's going to transition to a flame cap. You can see how that flame has dropped down and it's hugging the remains of the rick there. Next. Um, the kiln that we use most, these, you know, the, the, now, although we're starting to come up with some new designs, it's called the Oregon kiln because it's designed for our feedstocks. You can basically use any kind of container. It's not, the shape is not that important. But this one is um, big enough for our slash piles. It's um, not too heavy, so people can move it around in the woods. And it makes about a cubic yard of biochar in, in four hours if you've got good dry feedstock. Next. So we pile it loosely and we light it on top. Next. Once that first pile burns down, then we add more material one layer at a time. And we wanna keep it all the same size for the most efficient production. Next. 
It's important to always keep that flame on top because that's your source of heat. It's also your afterburner that burns your smoke. This could be challenging in Oregon where it rains all winter, um, if we're lucky. <laughs> and uh, so the loading rate becomes important uh, to keep that flame always on the top. Next. How do you know when it's done? It's done when the flame is all gone. That means that you've completely charred the material. And at that time, in these kilns, we use a flood quenching method. Um, next. The water quenching is the, the best way, but you need to be careful because char holds heat amazingly well. I've come back the next day when I hadn't had enough water in a kiln and saw found that it reignited, evaporated all the water and started burning the char. So you either flood it or you can also spread it very thin because that will help it lose heat or you can snuff. Next, we have um, made lid for the kiln. So that's another option to just exclude air. Next, so the kilns are great. Um, a lot of people point out though that we have a lot of biomass out there. So we need to think about ways to also scale this up. So here is, um, whoops. <laughs> okay, um, here's one of our slash giant slash piles. This was uh, in Ashland, Oregon, outside the town where they're doing a lot of thinning. Um, next, and so I had opportunity a couple of years ago to actually work with an air burner. This is the conventional air burner that's technology that's been around for many years. And they were concerned about generating smoke so close to the town. So they brought this in to dispose of these giant slash piles. You can see what the excavator is doing here is the pile on the, uh, the left is um, the the pile that he's working from, but there's a pile right in front of him that looks brown, that's mostly dirt. The, there's so much dirt in there that he's shaking it out before he puts it in the in the air burner. And what we found was because, partly I think because the material is so, so full of dirt and also green, next, is that this air burner made a lot of char. Um, and here's some of the char. And so it's very possible to make char in a conventional air burner. Next, how does this work? It's really a lot like our flame cap kilns, but instead of a passive counterflow, it's got an active counterflow using a blower. And that blower is what allows this thing to incinerate things completely to ash. So if you want to make char, there's, you can uh, maybe turn off or turn down the blower and also change the loading rate. And I think the Air Burners Inc. company now actually has a, a, a set of instructions on their website for doing this. Next. Now there's a new type of air burner from ROI, Tiger Cat. Uh, we saw this demonstrated last year in Oregon. And this has a set of augers that can pull the char out to uh, make it more of a continuous process and, and quench it. So that's a really neat invention. Um, next. But one of the things I noticed when I saw this in operation was that it really wasn't um, living up to its potential. Next slide. Um, because it could have been making more biochar than it was. And the reason why it wasn't making so much biochar is because of the way they were loading it. So we had too much size variation. You see the big log in there and the, the smaller material will burn to ash before that big log is completely charred. So to get the best efficiency out of this kind of equipment, you need to keep your feedstock size uniform. Next. All right, other ways to scale up. You know, we have talked about um, the, the toplet piles and the hand-loaded kilns in the woods. We've talked about landings where you could use something like an air burner. And um, so those are both for what I call stranded biomass. It doesn't pay its way out of the woods. It's too expensive It's um, to, to actually collect it up and move it to town where you could uh, use it in one of these other processes, um, levels three and four, medium, large, uh, where you could actually recover heat and electricity. 
so the combined heat and biochar is an interesting um, scale that has a lot of potential, I think. We did a webinar, Tom Miles and I did a webinar on combined heat and biochar um, technologies, which you can see at my website. And um, then, there, of course, there's the largest scale. Let me just show you one picture next of what I'm talking about, combined heat and biochar using uh, woody biomass. Um, this company makes this it's pretty much a wood biomass furnace, makes a couple of BT, million BTUs of heat energy, and it's got an auger there to pull the char out. Next. Then here's an example of a large scale, 30 megawatt power plant, biomass one power plant in Medford, Oregon. That's uh, one of the biggest biochar producers in the country right now. They can make biochar, heat, and electricity. Next. But to understand what is the right scale to use bio, forest biomass, you have to do life cycle assessment. I was fortunate to be able to participate in this Waste to Wisdom project, uh, working with um, Corum, um, consultancy group to do uh, help with the LCA for the biochar uh, pathway that was examined in this project. And so life cycle analysis looks at all of the inputs and outputs for a process to determine its climate impact. So with biochar, we have certain processes that contribute to greenhouse, greenhouse gases and certain things that um, remove greenhouse gases. So biomass growth and biochar added to soil are the removal parts, but the generating parts are mostly going to be found in thermochemical conversion and biomass logistics. So we looked at those for a couple of different biochar systems next. And here are the kind of things that we looked at. We looked at emissions. So for instance, a few people recently have been concerned about flame cap kilns and methane emissions so but if you compare it to the baseline um, the methane emissions of a flame cap kiln are about half of what you would find a little more than half of what you would find in an open burn pile so we're already doing better than the baseline and then the bsi machine which is this gasifier um, which was the other technology that was looked at is an order of magnitude less methane but you've got to balance emissions against um, of the, the thermochemical conversion process against emissions from all the biomass processing, which is considerable. So not only do you have um, transportation, but you also have chipping and drying. And, and so um, you've got to take all these factors into consideration and, and balance them out. Next. Here's, a, um, here's one of the results from this study comparing the Oregon kiln, um, an air burner with the blower off, uh, which is very similar to the Oregon kiln, and then this gasifier, this remote gasifier, which uses chipped material that has to be brought to a central site. Even though it's out in the woods, it still has to be brought um, to a central site in the woods. And the black bar there on each of these um, char bar graphs, the, the horizontal black line shows you where the balance point is. So really, you know, the, the more passive systems were had a better greenhouse house gas balance um, than the more active systems that use, you know, diesel for to make electricity, to run a blower that have to chip material and so forth. So um, next. So I wanna think in terms of not just scaling up, but also scaling out. So deploying more passive systems, simpler technology uh, across the landscape um, in remote areas where biomass is stranded and it doesn't make sense to transport it. Biomass management takes people power. You know, it, from the very beginning, it starts with a person with a chainsaw. Every time you touch that biomass, it costs you money. So, um, you know, and when you're working deep in the forest, you can't get a lot of machinery in there. It takes people power. So what we have to do is figure out how to pay for this work and we need to train the trainers. That's my big focus right now. 
Um, we're seeing a growing number of these project, projects uh, in the US. I've done workshops um, in several states sponsored by state forestry services and other agencies. Um, also doing more and more workshops locally sponsored by watershed councils, soil and water conservation districts, fire safe councils, and then other people are taking this up to Darren McAvoy at Utah State has been developing big box kilns. NRCS, I've done a, a few different programs with NRCS and, and some of our work resulted in the development of this cost share program under their conservation stewardship uh, program. And NRCS has a big interest in this with more programs to come. I think Kathleen will tell us a little bit about one of them at the end of this. And next. So um, some of the work I've done has been what you might call forest to farm work. So in Oregon, we have a lot of small woodlands that are privately owned that, um, you know, where the landowners may also have uh, small farms, livestock. This is Fraga Farm. Um, they're a, a hundred head goat dairy and uh, in, in the Willamette Valley near Portland, there are a lot of these old Christmas tree farms that never got harvested. And these things are now just a, a flat out danger because they're, it's fuel. And so they need to be treated. They're not really good for timber or anything else. So uh, we went to Fraga Farm on the invitation of the Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District last October next. And we you know, trained a lot of people in how to make biochar and um, have a little barbecue cookout while we're at it. Next. And at the end of the day, we ended up with a couple of cubic yards of biochar that are headed to the goat barn where they've already noticed um, decreases in, um, in odors and better improved conditions in the goat barn. So that's, that's an example of the kind of forest to farm projects we've been doing. Next. Um, also, even in places like North Dakota, where you would think there are a lot of trees, um, there are trees in the shelter belts and windbreaks there that um, are dying and have to be disposed of. So uh, um, the invitation of the North Dakota Forest Service, um, I've gone and done several workshops there looking at how to make biochar from, from that material. Um, using what people have on hand, like these cattle panels here, uh, as windbreaks, um, that's a really promising way to go. Next. And uh, another thing that, that is on hand in North Dakota is a lot of these old oil field tanks. So they're just lying around and um, you can get them for free or cheap. And so Derek Lowstuder at North Dakota Forest Service took one of these things and had it cut in half and made a kiln out of it. And we're using it in the field here to try to char some dead shelter belt trees. The wood will be used then to help regenerate the next generation of shelter belt trees. Now, this was kind of interesting, though, trying to figure out how to quench this thing at the end of the day. Um, we didn't have quite enough water, so we just flipped it over and then it snuffed itself out. So we're learning a lot. Next. And a lot of different partners engaging in this now, trying different approaches. This is a big box kiln from Darren McAvoy at Utah State. He's doing a lot of work. Check out some of their materials. They have some good instructional materials on how to make biochar in Oregon kilns. Um, and so we're learning. Next. This is one of our um, farms that is, um, or landowners, the U Creek Land Alliance that is um, a recipient of the cost share dollars from the conservation stewardship uh, program uh, for biochar, which pays $4,600 an acre. If you can get into this program, they'll pay you, they'll, they'll um, give you that amount of money to make biochar from woody debris. But uh, Ken Carloni um, is, um, has been trying to quantify things so we have a better idea of inputs and outputs next. And coming up with new innovations, an insulated kiln uh, to improve efficiency. Next, um, methods for determining um, you know, biochar outputs 
So, you know, we need to get dry, dry mass of biochar output and measure that next. Um, Ken and, um, and Darren uh, collaborated on uh, this project, which was to just get some scales so we could weigh the feedstock. It's really hard to know how, what your efficiency is when you can't weigh the feedstock. Um, next. And um, hope to do more of that kind of work, quantification. Also work, more work on better technologies for controlling emissions and cleaner burns. This was a kiln that I built a couple of years ago that has a heat shield around it and um, you know, very low emissions. The picture on the lower right shows that kiln in full operation. There's no smoke whatsoever. You can kind of see some heat waves coming out of it. So just having a, just having a shield to hold in the heat to get some um, uh, you know, air, hot air coming from that annular gap between the shield and the kiln. Um, we're, we're working on some new designs that, that hopefully will be cleaner. Next, and we need to measure the emissions. So we've got a few ideas about that. Um, all right, so further on the mission of quantification, uh, we did a project, um, stewardship project with South Umpqua Rural Community Partnership a few years ago. 17 acre thinning project and uh, generated a lot of biomass. And we wanted to see, you know, again, how, how this would work at a scale. Next. So we got some volunteers and took a couple of days, tried to measure how much slash we had, and we were able to measure the volume of biochar that we had. So we got a conversion rate out of that. Next. And then I wanted to do a, a hypothetical scenario based on that, you know, on those data where you would have something like 400 cubic yards of slash and um, an ideal crew, a trained crew of seven people, six people to operate kilns, each person operating two, one machine operator to move material closer to the kilns. Next. And, um, so coming up with all of that, we came up with, next, um, that it would take about a week to process all that slash and we would make 66 cubic yards of biochar. So at a conversion rate of 16.7%. Next. Okay, so, you know, the, the cost of that is one thing, but the, oh, it's easier to maybe look at the climate impact from that. So assuming a cubic yard of biochar weighs 200 pounds, we made 6.6 .6 tons of biochar in that week. And assuming that 80% of that is fixed carbon, multiplying that by the conversion to CO2, we came up with um, you know, close to 20 tons of CO2 that could be sequestered from that one 17 acre thinning project the average American emits about 20 tons of CO2 per year. So there you go. Seven people working for a week could sequester the carbon emissions from one average American. That just gives you a sense of, of the capacity of this sort of program. All right. Next. So now looking more at the, at the money part of it, trying to come up with with um, prescriptions, you know, that you could actually um, order up <laughs> this kind of job. Um, you know, payments for uh, fuels work are usually on a per acre basis. And so typically uh, it would cost about $1,100 an acre to do the thinning work. So cut, pile, and burn. That's $350 an acre for the chainsaws and $150 an acre for burning but $600 an acre for making those, those jackpot piles, they actually take quite a while to construct. So just hypothetically, I looked at, well, what if you changed your process from cut, pile, and burn to cut, char, and quench? And um, so you'd have to have uh, add a water truck, but you could take that $600 that you were using to pile 
and instead use that to um, to load kilns with biochar. So you're moving the same amount of material, but instead of piling it, you're just throwing it in a kiln. Um, so we need to prove this on the ground, but this is a place to start. Next. And when you think about the money involved and the effort, you know, I think the important thing to realize is to remember that in the United States, at least, we've done this before. And other countries are doing this um, and have done. So in the 1930s, in the middle of the Great Depression, President Roosevelt said, I want to create the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, to be used in doing all of this important ecological infrastructure work. And, and that, that took place, that happened, employed people, improved people's lives, and improved the environment and the land. Next. So I propose we create a new CCC, call it the Carbon Conservation Corps, because it's oriented towards saving our, our climate and uh, you know, a service year for young people where they could be out in the woods, uh, improving forest health, protecting communities from wildfire. We already put a lot of boots on the ground fighting wildfire. Let's use it for prevention. Pay them to sequester carbon in biochar. Get all these other benefits, physical fitness, outdoors, um, a sense of purpose, and maybe most importantly, hope for the future actually doing something to sequester carbon. Next. This is, this is an army, you know, this, we're going to have to train an army of tree workers. Um, we can do this, you know, the California Conservation Corps has kind of carried on the CC spirit, uh, CCC spirit for, for many, many years, um, and has uh, work, done a lot of this sort of work already. Next. Um, so we, they already know how to work with trees. We need to tr teach them now how to make biochar. Um, and that's what I've been doing quite a bit of, bringing more people in. Ken Carloni just helped me teach a biochar course at the Siskiyou Field Institute. Next. And other trainers, um, Plachtabach Via here, very experienced biochar um, person who's now living in the Portland area, helped me with a workshop, a couple of workshops in the Portland area last month. Next. And then of what we've done down in Chico, which is, is kind of taking off Steve Fair's group of Butte Community College students, other groups of um, students from CSU Chico. Um, now the Fire Safe Councils are doing more projects where they're including biochar. This was an interesting day. This was at the Big Chico Creek Ecological Reserve. And I learned from the ecologists there to, that they were making small piles because they don't want the wildlife to move in. <laughs> so they're making lots of little small piles, lighting them. And then at the end, before they burn to ash, just take a shovel and scoop up the char, the glowing coals, and spread it out. Just kind of fling it out on the landscape. It's winter, it's wet, it, the char chunks, um, the coals go out. And so you've done your quenching and distribution step in, in one motion. So there's a lot more to learn. A lot of people are working on this. Um, next. This was um, the Pacific Northwest International Society of Arborists invited me to their training conference last fall in Eugene. And, you know, these are the people who touch the trees. Okay. You know, like I said, biomass management is an intimate process. People have to touch the biomass to, to move it. And these people are touching the trees and they are the people who can make the biochar. As the writer Wendell Berry says, what are people for? Anyway, you know, if we're not doing something to save our forests, what are we doing? What are we for? All right, um, next. So I have a lot of resources on my website, wilsonbiochar.com. Most of them are free, open source kiln designs, a biochar job estimating handbook, 
step-by-step -step instructions for using flame cap kilns uh, and, um, and lots of other guidelines that we produce through a, a NRCS conservation stewardship, um, or excuse me, NRCS conservation innovation grant on forest to farm. So please check those out and download them. And um, there's a couple little eBooks that I'm charging money for if you wanna support my work, you know, please go ahead and buy one of those. And with that, I am finished next. And Kathleen is gonna tell us a little bit more about um, new NRCS programs. Thanks so much, Kelpie. That was really excellent. Um, and I do wanna thank you for all the work you've been doing. And Kelpie is really one of the main people responsible for the development of a new program through the National Research Conservation Service, which is an agency within the US Department of Agriculture for those joining us from outside of the US. Um, and they have just announced, although it's not on their website yet, a new program called the Soil Carbon Amendment Protocol or Code 808. Uh, and a lot of the details are still being worked out on this, but the bottom line seems to be that there will be funding to pay U.S. farmers, and I think also foresters that have low carbon soils to boost their carbon levels by incorporating biochar and or compost. So as of about a month ago, this program had been adopted by 10 states, largely in the Northeast, but also California, Oregon, Colorado. I don't have the latest list. Um, and the funding was supposed to start in the fall. We don't know how much total funding, how it will be allocated per farm or per region. Uh, and, and given the pandemic, we're, we're not sure if this timeline is going to be pushed back. We are still trying to get updated information and I hope to host a webinar with them at some point. Um, and for those that are outside of the US, it might still be of interest in terms of advocating for similar programs in your respective countries. So uh, again, I will um, thank Kelpie. We're gonna go to some questions, but uh, now if you haven't already posted a question, please do so in the, in the questions tab. There was an earlier question about snuffing the fire and, and they uh, later said they understood it, but I wonder if you can talk about when you would do that and, and how you do it. I know you had some great pictures, but I think it's really important because if you don't do it well, you can lose all the biochar. Yes, that's true. Snuffing with the, so quenching is using water and snuffing is excluding air. So think about the fire triangle. What do you need to sustain a fire? You need fuel, you need oxygen, and you need um, heat. So if you remove any one of those three things, you can put the fire out. So snuffing with a lid is removing the air. So you, if you use a lid, make sure you, you've got it tightly sealed. And I like to use um, just a, a flat piece of steel that fits down inside the kiln right on top of the char and then seal up the edges with dirt. That seems to work pretty well. Um, I did show one picture where we we tried to snuff it out with some wet steer manure. <laughs> I don't know if you people caught that. Um, there was a lot of it around, <laughs> so <laughs> it made sense. But actually, when we came back the next day, that manure had kind of dried out and was starting to burn. So we <laughs> ended up having to dump it and putting it put it out with water. Sometimes your best bet really is just to dump it out and spread it thin. And then if you don't have a lot of water, you know, you can just spray a little water on it or if you spread it thin enough and mix it with dirt, it's going to go out. And when you're just doing it in the woods, that's maybe not a bad idea because then you've done your application process as well. Yeah, and one thing I would add is that in desert-like conditions where water is expensive, you know, snuffing is, is pretty much the way to go. And, and one other thing, thing to think about is if you don't want high moisture content biochar, uh, I can give an example that we're working on in uh, Colombia where we're going to be using it as charcoal uh, to displace coal in drying coffee cherries. So that might be another reason to snuff versus quench. Yes, definitely. One thing to keep in mind though is if you have a large kiln, you know, a couple of cubic yards or cubic meters, sorry for all my 
English units. <laughs> um, uh, you know, the bigger it is, the more heat it's going to hold. And so it could take days for it to cool down enough, um, you know, before you can actually open it. Yeah. There was a question about whether it's important for the rick to be built up so high when you're starting the fire in a flame cap kiln? Well, it really all depends on your feedstock. You know, if you have super dry stuff, no. If you have wetter material, you might want it to build, be built up so high just so you can get some more air in there. Um, you know, every feedstock's different. It, um, so, and every kiln is different. You just have to do your own experiments. Kelby, do you have any particular ways in which you kind of measure the moisture content? Is it just snapping it or you let it dry for as long as you can or anything like that? Oh, yes. Well, I, get, I use a moisture meter and it's an inexpensive tool. Uh, I think I get paid 25 bucks for mine online and it's just you know a little meter with two pins that you stick into the wood and it measures the conductivity um moisture changes the conductivity of the wood and it gives you a little readout my general rule of thumb in oregon is i don't want to char anything that's more than 25 percent moisture but i'll tell you what i've had to <laughs> but it really you know above 30 percent forget it don't even try um ideally you know 10 15 percent is is lovely mm -hmm. great i don't know if you're aware of the trillion trees initiative but there was a question on whether um producing biochar can somehow be beneficial to that initiative i'm sure it can yes we should we should try to get that included uh Okay, if burn piles are replaced with kilns for biochar production, how and where does the biochar get used? Do you leave it or spread it in the forest or does it get used somewhere else or possibly sold? Good question. I don't think that this method of making biochar is really a method for commercial production. Um, if you're, you know, it is very viable though for a forest to farm situation like the Fraga farm. You know where they're going to use that material in their um, in their barns, and so with the kilns, it is it is nice because it is it can be contained and you can keep it clean and free of dirt um, if if you flood quench or snuff it, and you know then you can load it into a trailer or whatever you need to to take it to where you're going to use it on the farm. In a forestry situation. Um, I really am a big advocate for leaving it in the forest to improve the forest because every time you add a process, you know, whether it's transport or crushing or anything, you add to the carbon footprint of the production. And the idea is we want to get biochar in the ground. So there you are in a forest where the soil needs the char. So leave it right there. You had at least one really nice picture showing that you were putting it around existing trees. Do you uh, put any nutrients in it? Do you try to incorporate it into the soil or do you leave it on top? I think it's just really going to depend a lot on, on the ecosystem that you're in and what your objectives are. Um, in, a, in a forest, I think, you know, in a, in a natural fire, the char, some of it will end up underground as roots burn. But most of the char is going to be on the surface. But what happens is you have litter fall from trees that end up, you know, that's part of the soil building process in a forest. So it'll get covered with litter fall and be incorporated into the soil on its own. So I think you can really just kind of scatter it in a forest. Um, as far as nutrients, it, actually the objective in the oak forest there was to absorb nitrogen their excess nitrogen there and to try and discourage weed species. So no, we didn't add nutrients. There was a question about how much biochar would you tend to put around a tree, which I'm sure is variable, but maybe you could give an idea. Um, 
Yeah, it's it would just be variable. I mean, in general, you know, when I'm applying biochar, I like to, I would say, you know, a centimeter or, or two, um, light, you know, kind of loosely scattered around a tree. Uh, you know, if it's a tree in your yard, go ahead and incorporate it a little bit if you want. Um, it's hard to have general guidelines for these things. Yeah. Did, did you mean a centimeter in terms of depth? And then is it around the drip line or? Yes, around the drip line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I well, you know, um, there are a lot of people who've done a lot of work with street trees and urban trees and legacy trees. I think Carbon Gold has done a lot of work with some legacy trees and, um, you know, the folks in, in Stockholm, Sweden have done a lot of work with urban landscaping where you would incur incorporate. And there are different ways to do that. You can use a soil auger, you can use an air spade to actually blow soil away from the roots and then incorporate biochar and nutrients in the root zone. So if you have a legacy tree that you're trying to save, you know, that's not healthy, you would do a lot more than just, you know, you're in a forest and you want to improve the water holding capacity in a forest soil. Um, you know, if you, I think it, it, there are applications where you might even want to put some mulch on top of the char rather than trying to incorporate it, but um, spread out the char and then put some mulch on top because uh, I know sometimes char can actually, if there's a thick layer of it, it could actually serve in some cases to wick water away from the soil. So, um, but I think, you know, we don't usually have an excess of char. So just sort of lo loosely scattering it around in a forest is probably the best approach and it'll get incorporated over time. Mm -hmm. Helpy, I'm sure you've taken the temperature of the fires. Is there much variability and what kind of range in temperatures do you tend to see? In, in the fires, do you mean in the, in the yeah, burning? Yeah, in the kiln. Yeah, um, it's interesting because you, what I've observed is that as you, as you fill the kiln up, the bottom of the kiln cools off pretty quickly. And I don't have a lot of sophisticated temperature measuring devices. I have one of those little infrared laser thermometers. So I can get the temperature of the sides of the kiln pretty well. And in the middle of a burn, usually the bottom of the kiln is, is the temperatures drop down to, sorry about this, Fahrenheit, 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, you know, about the temperature where you would bake cookies. And of the top of the kiln where the flame is active is maybe 700 degrees Fahrenheit. So really not much hotter than a wood stove. Um, However, the temperature formation of the char is a different thing because it's happening right in the flame. And, uh, you know, the flame temperature could be anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, maybe even more. So I don't really know. You know, when you start, when you look at an air burner with added air, then you're getting up to more, you know, 2,000 or more degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, I, I've seen a lot of variability as well. Um, so there was a question uh, that when you were talking about biochar being able to suppress weeds by pre reducing volatile nitrogen, uh, they asked if you could um, talk a little bit more about that. Sure, well, biochar absorbs nitrogen. So um, that's a theory anyway. And, uh, you know, I think there's plenty of research papers showing biochar in field trials where they've seen, yep, it, it absorbed nitrogen from the soil. And, the you know, in the first year, the plants actually didn't do as well as the control sometimes because they put in plain uncharged biochar. And then, you know, the second by the second year, <laughs> it's been charged and now the plants are doing better, but it has that initial effect of absorbing nitrogen often. There was a question about whether the Oregon kiln allows the use of thicker pieces of wood versus a smaller cone kiln. 
Um, you know, yeah, size, it's all about the size. You know, I have, uh, there, I have, I've made cone kilns, I've made um, the pyramid, truncated pyramid style, I've used boxes, I've used rings. Um, it's all about the size, really, because the bigger cross-sectional area you have on a kiln, the more heat you generate. It's sort of, the, the you know, the more power, the more heat energy. So if you have big pieces, then you want a big kiln. Um, one of the things that I'm trying to emphasize here in Oregon is that a lot of times we're burning bigger material than we really need to for the for fuels, for safety, for trying to reduce fuels. So anything that's bigger than you know five five or six inches, we don't need to burn. We don't even need to burn five and six inch stuff. Anything bigger than four inches really can be left on the ground and it won't be a fuel hazard in terms of you know contributing to wildfire danger. It's the small brush and the smaller limbs that are the the fire hazard. So those are the things that are easy, easier to turn to char and that's what we should char. Um, you know, a lot of times people burn big stuff just to get rid of it and all they're doing is, is putting particulates in the air. So as a waste disposal method, it's kind of stupid. Um, <laughs> you know, leave it on the ground where it can absorb moisture and provide habitat and, and um, yeah. Could you talk a little bit more about how you start the fires? What equipment you use or techniques? Sure, um, I use a propane torch and um, I like that rather than a liquid accelerant, it's a little safer. Uh, you can use a liquid accelerant. Um, if I have very dry material, you only need a match, you know, so that's ideal. We don't really want to use propane, but being in Oregon where our fuels are usually on the damp side, it it's very helpful. Mm -hmm. And is there any uh, way that you test the quality of the biochar you produced? Yes, yeah, so when we did the the conservation innovation grant, we had some money to do some biochar testing. And um, I have a lot of reports on my website. And there's a a, a really lengthy report on that project there. Um, so check that out. Um, and I have got a table there of different chars that we tested, mostly looking at carbon content, carbon versus ash. And the 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 char we make is is pretty darn good. It's as good as a lot of commercial chars in terms of ash and pH and um, carbon content, fixed carbon. I did, there was a, a grad student in New Zealand, trying to remember his name. I sent him early on some samples from my kilns and he did, um, oh gosh, what is that? Um, one of these fancy <laughs> analysis techniques where he looked at the degree of carbonization, the, de the amount of aromatic carbon in the material. And he said, this was made at a thousand degrees centigrade. If you look at the amount of you know, aromatic carbon in here. So, um, so you know, that's why I meant about the temperature, the, the chars formed in the flame. So the temperature of the side of the kiln does not really indicate the char formation temperature. So it is formed at a very high temperature. So it is usually very highly recalcitrant. Now you'll get differences depending on your feedstocks, uh, but in general, the feedstocks we used um, they're about 80% fixed carbon, so um, and and highly recalcitrant. You may want to just define recalcitrant because not everyone knows what that means. Uh, it's just the de degree of aromatic carbon, so the um, the amount of uh, fused carbon rings. So it's less. There's uh, the carbon in char is usually divided between volatile matter or labile matter and recalcitrant matter. So the recalcitrant matter is recalcitrant. It's hard to degrade because it's more has more fused carbon rings. Right. And and so it's it's all about longevity and how long that'll stay uh, in in the soils and not go back into the atmosphere. Exactly. Um, I think that was John McDonald Warry, if I recall. Yes. 
Thank you. Uh, the other question was on whether you need to leave the slash on the ground for several months to dry before processing, which probably wouldn't work in Oregon too much, <laughs> given all your rain. That's one of the biggest challenges because, um, yeah, we want it to be dry. Um, I have charred green brush when it's small diameter. It actually can char fairly well, depending on the species. Some brush species have a lot of volatile oils in them. And in the drying process, they lose those oils. And that, that's fuel. So if you can get a fire started, then a lot of times you can actually char green brush and get pretty good conversion rates because even though there's water, there's also more fuel. So that's kind of interesting. Um, bigger material won't work that way. Um, so drying fuels, you know, it takes, in my area, it takes, a, a you know, maybe 60 days in the sun for a uh, two to three inch material to get dry enough. So it, it doesn't take that long, but that is a really big issue because one of the reasons why fuels are piled is because then you can cover them. So you can go back in the middle of winter um, when it's wet and you've got at least part of the pile has, um, you know, put a little piece of plastic in there. Part of the pile has some dry material under the plastic so you can light it. If you just leave it out on the ground, you, you shorten your window of burning because we can't burn in the summer. We have Mediterranean climate here and it's hot and dry in the summer. It's too dangerous. So we can't burn until the rains start in the fall. Usually, you know, by the end of October, it's safe to burn. And we have enough rain that it's safe, but not so much rain that everything's gotten soaked. So we might have a month, six weeks, where we could go out and take uncovered material and successfully char it. Then again, we might get another window in the spring, you know, if we have a, um, if things dry out in May and then it's, you, you know, it's, it's still possible to burn in early June, you might have another month where you could burn material that wasn't covered. Mm -hmm. this, this question comment might be a little bit off topic, but I know you have experience in this as well. It says, thank you for the presentation and fielding questions. Is there a market for commercial production, say a 40 megawatt facility that produces 160,000 tons of OMRI certified and certified biochar. How to benefit <laughs> the region partnering with larger ecosystem restoration agroforestry projects. Do you see this coming online in the coming months or years? Well, it already exists. I mean, the Biomass One power plant in Medford, what well, they they take a lot of green waste from the city of Medford. So the urban forest, I didn't talk about it at all, but it's hugely significant in this. This is where we're gonna get a lot of the material that will run these bigger plants that will provide energy, you know, as well. And um, so, but that that power plant takes green waste, but it also takes mill waste and some um, C&D waste and, and some logging waste, you know, some, some logging slash. But, you know, it can't really draw from remote areas because the cost of transportation is too great so but where you have a, a forested region where there's there's um you know forest products industry and 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 timber production um and sawmills and and you know some logging that's that's close enough to to town where you can actually afford to transport some of that slash then yes that's you can absolutely do that um, it's all really predicated on the distance, the transportation distances. I would add, though, that uh, 160,000 tons of biochar is probably more than the current U.S. market. <laughs> so we, we oh, still okay. develop Catch markets. That. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there's a lot more production uh, coming online. And so we, we still need to focus on developing, especially regional markets. Um, Absolutely. involved in educating people about how to use it and where to use it and those types of things. So a question, uh, again, a little off topic, but can biochar be used for desert greening? If yes, what are its benefits and how can it be used? 
Well, when you're talking about deserts, you're you're often talking about um, alkaline soils. So yes, biochar can be used. Biochar, I think, can be used in any soil, but you you know you do need to pay attention to pH. And so in deserts, uh, you you need to make sure you're not going to make your pH problem worse. There are many different ways to acidify biochar. The best and easiest way is to compost it with other organic materials, um, use it to manage the huge waste stream of organic materials like manure, food waste, all of this stuff, and create a really good slow release high carbon fertilizer. There was a question uh, which we touched on a little bit earlier uh, about longevity, because you had mentioned that char in the soil itself uh, may not last long, or sorry, the implication was that it may not last long. How long does biochar last in the soil? Tens, twenties, hundreds of years, or what? What's the half-life? It's a bit of a technical well, I'm question. Not sure, I'm not sure what the questioner is referring to because um, I don't think I said that, but you know, sorry, there's- the, what, what they said was you, you mentioned that managed forests do not have much char in the soil itself. Oh. That's because that's that's you have to look at the soil horizon. So the soil horizon, the depth of the soil, it's a history of soil formation. The older soils had a lot more char. So <clears throat> the newer soils don't have as much char because not as much char is being produced because wildfires produce char. So um, so no, it, there's it's not about longevity in soil. It's about soil formation and the newer soils not having char because of fire exclusion but as far as how long char lasts in soil that you know there have been a lot of papers written on that um the you know the the recalcitrance is an important factor high temperature biochars generally are more recalcitrant so more of the um, more labile compounds have been burned out um and that's we're making mostly high temperature biochars. We're making some, you know, we always end up with some partially burned material, but that's never a concern for me because um, that's just microbe food. So in terms of soil health, that's a good thing. Um, and in terms of quantifying it, you know, ask the ask the lab laboratory scientists that question. <laughs> I think we I think it's been pretty well shown that the these highly recalcitrant jars can last for thousands of years. I mean, the example I always use when I'm, um, you know, trying to tell people about biochar is look at an archaeological site where there was a campfire 10,000 years ago. How are they dating that site? They're taking the charcoal and carbon dating it. So, you know, it's still there 10,000 years later. <laughs> Yeah, we have a lot more questions. Um, I'm only going to ask this one last one because it's probably my favorite question. Do you think biochar spread around trees could help keep pocket gophers away? <laughs> Nothing will keep pocket gophers away. <laughs> uh, but try it. Let me know. They probably will love it. No, animals like to eat biochar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Good point. Uh, well, as I said, we have more questions than we have time. Um, we'll we'll take a look at what we can do to answer some of the ones we didn't have time to get to. But uh, Caroline, could you just go to the next slide? So normally I have uh, some dates lined up for future webinars, and I don't have a date yet for the next one, which will be on the topic of the use and production of biochar on dairy farms. Uh, it should be sometime in late April, and then we'll also look at doing an updated one on biochar in carbon removal marketplaces, since we now have two platforms that are including biochar in their um, uh, removal categories. Uh, and I should probably host one on biochar and COVID-19, as I've been asked a number of times in the past week if there's a way for biochar to help with this pandemic. But beyond carbonizing all of the personal productive gear, I don't know if we have an answer uh, to that with any certainty 
if any of you listeners happen to have some thoughts on that, I'd be very interested. Next slide. So for any of you that joined us today as a non-member, we would love to have you consider becoming an IBI member. Um, and to encourage that, we have a special offer that's good through the end of the month. But I would just like to thank Kelpie again for putting the time into creating this uh, presentation. And I hope you have found value in it and hope you all stay safe. Thanks for joining us and I hope you'll join us in the future. Bye.